section thirty of edmund dantes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org edmund dantes by edmund flagg chapter twenty eight captain joliet's love in a small cosy and elegant suite of apartments in a mansion on the rue des capucines resided mademoiselle louise d'armilly and her brother leon as has already been stated the celebrated cantatrice had retired from the boards in consequence of having inherited a fortune of several millions of francs from the estate of her deceased father who rumour asserted had been a very wealthy parisian banker leon had abandoned the stage simultaneously with his sister who had invited him to share her suddenly acquired riches for strange to say the banker had not bequeathed to him a single sou the immense inheritance had been a complete surprise to mademoiselle d'armilly and for some time she had hesitated to accept it as a condition imposed by the will was her immediate withdrawal from her operatic career and the prima donna was as ambitious as gifted but finally she had yielded to the persuasive eloquence of the notary and the earnest entreaties of her friends cancelling all her engagements and with them abandoning her bright professional future the director of the academie royale demanded a large sum to release the artiste from her contract with him and this was paid by the notary with an alacrity that seemed to suggest he was not acting solely according to the directions of the will but was influenced by some personage who chose to remain in the background the notary also paid all other demands made by the various operatic managers who claimed they would lose by mademoiselle d'armilly's failure to appear these amounts were not deducted from the legacy a circumstance that gave additional colour to the supposition that the will of the deceased banker was not the sole factor in the celebrated cantatrice's good luck one evening shortly after paris had again quieted down mademoiselle d'armilly was seated in the little apartment that served her as a salon and with her was her brother leon the contrast between the pair seemed intensified in private life louise had that dark imperious majestic beauty usually possessed by brunettes her figure was full and finely developed her black eyes had the deep intense fire of passion and her faultless countenance glowing with health and loveliness indicated at once firmness decision and caprices without number leon on the contrary was delicate and feminine in appearance he had exceedingly small feet and hands and a single glance at his strikingly handsome face was sufficient to convince any experienced judge of human nature that he possessed a mild and yielding disposition the young man bore not the remotest family likeness to his sister and it was difficult to realize that they could be in any way related leon quitted his sister and going to a piano that stood in one corner of the apartment softly opened it and commenced lightly running his fingers over the keys then he seated himself at the instrument and played an air from lucrezia borgia with brilliancy and effect that only a finished performer could attain at the first notes louise arose and approaching the piano stood beside the player her eyes sparkling with appreciation and delight so absorbed were the brother and sister that they did not hear a soft knock at the door and only at the conclusion of the air did they realize that a visitor was in the apartment leon sprang from the instrument in confusion behaving like a startled girl but mademoiselle d'armilly with perfect self-control turned to the newcomer and said in a tone of mingled coquetry and merriment so so captain joliet your military career has accustomed you to surprising the enemy to such an extent that it has become second nature with you and you cannot avoid carrying your favourite tactics even into private life captain joliet for it was indeed he bowed and answered with a smile you must allow me solemnly to protest against classing yourself and your brother with the enemy you are both of you very dear friends especially louise said leon with a sly look and a pretty little ringing laugh leon leon when will you learn wisdom exclaimed mademoiselle d'armilly 
a blush mantling her visage and adding to its voluptuous beauty never i suppose returned her brother still laughing but i am already well acquainted with the value of discretion and therefore will withdraw as he uttered those words leon kissed the tips of his fingers to louise and joliette and lightly ran from the salon when he had disappeared the captain folded mademoiselle d'armilly in his arms and kissed her tenderly upon the forehead oh louise said he enthusiastically i love you more and more every day the former artiste gently disentangled herself from his embrace and smiling archly led him to a chair then she sat down upon another at a short distance from him no no said joliette warmly come and sit beside me on the sofa even leon sees that i adore you and all my friends in paris are aware that i am seeking your hand in marriage why will you be so formal and distant with me she arose and did as he requested joliet seated at her side put his arm about her waist louise did not resist but still maintained an air of coquetry that was displeasing to the ardent young soldier albert she said in a low musical voice do you indeed love me as you say love you louise cried joliet i would lay down my life for you are you quite sure you love me for myself and not because of the resemblance you say i bear to the woman you once so ardently admired what was her name ah eugenie danglars said she looking at him with a piercing gaze quite sure louise quite sure besides mademoiselle danglars has disappeared has not been seen or heard of for several years and no doubt is dead and yet you do not mourn for her how strange i never loved her as i love you louise eugenie danglars was a capricious and eccentric girl and had she lived would have been a capricious and eccentric woman it was well for me she vanished when she did but by the way another singular and inexplicable coincidence is that louise d'armilly the name you bear was also the name of mademoiselle danglars music teacher i cannot understand it at all there is no necessity for you to understand it anyhow it is a coincidence as you say nothing more well louise let us speak no further about either the resemblance or the coincidence suffice it that i love you and you alone that i love you for yourself your words make me very happy albert replied mademoiselle d'armilly and her full red lips looked so luscious ripe and alluring that joliette could not resist the temptation to bestow a long burning kiss upon them be my wife then dearest louise cried the captain and i will prolong your happiness until death shall strike me down ah albert men are so fickle they become infatuated with women and declare and no doubt think they could pass their lives at their charmer's feet but possession dulls the lustre of the brightest jewel and the devoted lover is speedily replaced by a careless if not faithless husband who instead of making his wife happy as he has sworn to do forsakes her side to bask in the smiles of sirens it will never be so with me my own my love protested joliet kissing her again and again i swear it i know the value of a lover's oath albert murmured louise with a meaning look when i was the brightest operatic star of the day many of them were breathed in my ear but they were trifles light as air forgotten as soon as uttered besides should i consent to become your wife you would be forced to leave me in france and return to africa in obedience to the call of duty the lovely women of algeria are prodigal of their beauties and endearments and under the spell of some subtle arab enchantress you would either forget poor louise d'armilly altogether or remember her only as a clog upon your pleasures and amorous delights nay nay you wrong me among all the dusky sirens of algeria there exists not one who could make me forget you for a single instant they are brazen shameless women who love with a recklessness and boldness that can only disgust a frenchman but they can dazzle even a frenchman render him delirious with passion and ere he is aware weave a web around him through which he cannot break 
my heart tells me you are as susceptible to feminine wiles as the rest of your countrymen and that perhaps you have already had half a dozen love affairs in algeria oh louise louise it grieves me to the soul that you can thus doubt me give me a chance to prove my love and you shall be more than satisfied that i can be loyal and true mademoiselle d'armilly gazed at him with a singular expression on her dark beautiful countenance it thrilled him to the very marrow of his bones and caused his arm that was about her waist to tremble violently at that moment the former cantatrice resembled eugenie danglars more than ever her breath was hot and convulsive as it struck his cheek and a faint suspicion that all was not right that she was playing a role with him shot across his mind for the first time with this suspicion came jealousy and releasing her waist he said in a gasping tone you have another lover louise a lover you prefer to me am i not right mademoiselle d'armilly laughed a short nervous laugh and answered in a voice that seemed to mock him i have had hosts of ardent admirers in my time do you refer particularly to any individual i know not i am beside myself with passion for you and the mere fancy that another man may have the first place in your heart is unbearable to me but there is one conclusive way in which you can prove my suspicion my jealousy groundless marry me albert replied louise with a renewal of the singular expression of countenance that had so agitated him i shall never marry any one i cannot i dare not the young man was startled as if by an electric shock he drew back and gazed at her with wide-opened eyes speechless from astonishment after a brief pause mademoiselle d'armilly continued in a dry hard tone you do not understand me and i cannot expect you to for i can neither tell you my motives nor lay bare my sad history to you you must be content with my decision i shall not marry captain joliette strong man as he was could not control his emotion he buried his face in his hands and groaned aloud the young woman gazed at him half pityingly half triumphantly she felt compassion for her stricken lover but above all gloried in the overwhelming power of her charms that could so subdue a manly victorious young soldier and make him her helpless slave is there then no shadow of a hope at length asked joliette in a hoarse whisper not the shadow of a hope replied mademoiselle d'armilly firmly you can be my friend my brother if you will but never my husband the young man recoiled in horror at the suggestion that seemed to be conveyed by this permission what do you mean by friend he asked a cold shiver passing through him louise laughed a short nervous laugh and looking him full in the eyes replied you know what i mean i love you better than any man i ever met save one captain joliette slowly arose to his feet and stood staring at her his passion and his scruples waging a bitter battle within him for the mastery the temptress half reclined on the sofa a miracle of seductive grace and voluptuous beauty he moved toward her as if to seize her in his arms then suddenly checking himself he asked with a convulsive gasp and that man that one was separated from me for ever through the vile machinations of that mysterious and cold-blooded fiend the count of monte cristo the count of monte cristo exclaimed the young man lost in amazement yes the count of monte cristo who afterwards disappeared from paris and has not since been heard of you mistake the count of monte cristo is in paris now he calls himself edmond dantes and is the celebrated deputy from marseilles over whom everybody has gone wild for some time past mademoiselle d'armilly's eyes flashed with fury then i will have my revenge upon him at last she cried i will amply repay him for introducing the so-called prince cavalcanti into my father's house and thus breaking off the match between albert and myself albert yes albert de morcerf now eugenie danglars i know you and it is useless for you to attempt the denial of your identity longer the young woman leaped up from the sofa with terror pictured upon her visage and seizing captain joliette by the arm with a powerful grasp cried out and how pray do you know i am eugenie danglars 
you unwittingly betrayed yourself by revealing the names of monte cristo and cavalcanti besides eugenie look at me well i am albert de morcerf with a wild cry the retired prima donna sank back upon the sofa you albert de morcerf she exclaimed i cannot believe it but my mother the former countess de morcerf who is now the wife of edmond dantes will vouch for my identity the young woman passed her hand across her forehead as if dazed if you are albert de morcerf you must despise me after what has taken place this evening she said bitterly despise you no i pity and forgive you albert said she softly come here and sit beside me on this sofa i have something to say to you the soldier obeyed when he was seated he said eugenie why did you tell me i could be your friend simply because i have long suspected your secret and wished to ascertain the real nature of your feelings toward me you not only resisted a terrible temptation the most terrible temptation to which a young ardent and passion-smitten man can be exposed but by your honour conclusively established the purity and sincerity of your love o oh, albert albert are you satisfied with my explanation and do you still think me worthy of you my own eugenie my happiness is far too great for words murmured the delighted young man gathering his beautiful companion in a warm embrace and repeatedly kissing her ripe lips and blushing cheeks it was soon known throughout paris that captain joliette and albert de morcerf were identical and that mademoiselle d'armilly was in reality no other than mademoiselle eugenie danglars daughter of baron danglars the once famous and opulent parisian banker the report also was current that albert and eugenie were engaged and would shortly be united in the bonds of matrimony another bit of gossip was to the effect that the former cantatrice's brother leon was not a man but a woman in short the real louise d'armilly who had loaned her name to eugenie danglars and assumed male attire solely for professional purposes this story was speedily confirmed for leon soon vanished and in his place appeared a most attractive and fascinating lady who very quietly assumed or rather resumed the name of louise d'armilly still another rumour was that the wealth so strangely inherited by the former prima donna was not a legacy at all but a gift from the mysterious count of monte cristo who had thus striven to make amends to the daughter for the misfortunes he had while pursuing his scheme of wholesale vengeance so remorselessly heaped upon the head of the father End of section thirty. Section thirty one of Edmund Dantes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Edmund Dantes by Edmund Flagg. Chapter twenty nine Zuleika goes to Monsieur Dantes monsieur dantes was sitting alone in his library busily engaged in reading a favourite work on the subject of political economy and from time to time making copious notes it was after midnight and the vast mansion on the rue du elder was as silent as the tomb the lamp on the deputy's table burned brightly but a large metallic shade concentrated the light and reflected it upon the table so that the other portions of the apartment were shrouded in almost complete darkness as m dantes read a shadow suddenly fell on the page of his book and quickly looking up he saw his daughter zuleika standing beside him tears were in her eyes and a look of melancholy rested upon her countenance why child said her father in a startled tone what is the matter with you you are weeping and seem very sad has anything happened to young Massetti? not that i am aware of papa answered zuleika in a low voice but nevertheless it is of him i wish to speak m dantes pushed his book from him motioned his daughter to a seat and prepared to listen as she did not begin at once 
but seemed to hesitate he said kindly i am waiting little one proceed thus encouraged zuleika summoned up all her strength and with downcast eyes commenced papa said she in the first place let me assure you that this is no mere lover's quarrel but a matter of the utmost importance that demands immediate action m dantes knitted his brows has the viscount been guilty of any impropriety toward you he asked fiercely no papa not toward me but i fear he may have been guilty of impropriety or at least of indiscretion with regard to another in the past a woman no doubt yes papa a woman a roman peasant i heard of some such thing while you were at the convent school in rome but dismissed it as a slander there may however be some truth in it but now i recollect giovanni's name was not associated with the scandal it was a mere inference on my part that connected him with the youthful member of the roman aristocracy mentioned by the gossips perhaps i am unjust papa in reviving your suspicions but giovanni's strange behaviour when i asked him the cause of his quarrel with esperance and of the continued coldness between them forced me to think there was something wrong his quarrel with esperance ah now i remember there was a quarrel but i imagined it was settled and that their relations were altogether friendly they are enemies papa or seem to be and that is not all esperance accuses giovanni of having been guilty of some infamous deed you have spoken to esperance then on the subject yes papa and what did he say he dealt in vague denunciations and positively refused to give me any definite information that is singular but what is still more so is that both giovanni and esperance seem bound by some fearful oath not to disclose the dread secret in their possession bound by an oath yes papa but why both of them should have been so bound unless they were accomplices i cannot see i even went so far as to accuse esperance of complicity whereupon he grew as white as chalk and protested his entire innocence and in his confusion uttered the name of luigi vampa zuleika zuleika you certainly misunderstood your brother he could not have mentioned the name of that man do you know who this luigi vampa is perfectly papa luigi vampa is a notorious roman brigand exactly my child and therefore could not possibly have had any dealings either with the viscount or esperance but i am sure of the name nevertheless esperance said luigi vampa m dantes was evidently startled he arose to his feet and paced the library excitedly zuleika had expected this and hence was not surprised at last her father resumed his seat and when he again came within reach of the lamp's rays she saw that his visage was even more pallid than usual and that he was not a little agitated she waited for him to speak and in a few seconds he did so zuleika said he in a tone of decision i will see both the viscount and my son in regard to this matter for now that luigi vampa seems to have had a share in it close investigation is imperatively demanded you may interrogate them papa but i am convinced in advance that you will derive no information from either of them the strange power that holds sway over them you cannot break but there is one thing you can do what is that zuleika write to luigi vampa write to vampa why should i do that because i feel assured that he is in possession of the full details of the terrible secret whatever it may be and will communicate them to you if you ask him to do so m dantes gazed at his daughter curiously what makes you think i have such influence over this roman brigand he asked sharply oh papa do not be angry with me cried zuleika but i have heard how vampa released the viscount de morcerf at your simple solicitation without a single franc of ransom though he had previously demanded a very large amount from the unfortunate man as the price of his liberty 
i have heard this and the natural inference i drew was that if the brigand chief went so far as to surrender his prey to you he would certainly answer your letter and tell you all he knew about the matter that so closely concerns my happiness and esperance's good name i am not angry with you my child replied the deputy in a milder tone for i know how deeply you have this affair at heart i will write to luigi vampa as you desire this very night and in two weeks at the furthest his answer may be expected but to-morrow i will talk with esperance and then will question the viscount rest assured that this matter shall be sifted to the bottom i know the extent of your love for giovanni massetti i also feel confident that i am not deceived in him and that he will be amply able to prove himself entirely worthy of your hand i have seen too much of men's alike and studied them too deeply to be deceived in reading character oh thank you thank you ever so much papa both for your promise and your kind encouraging words i too have full faith in giovanni but still i cannot rest satisfied until his record is entirely and conclusively cleared no one must have the power to breathe even a suspicion against the good name of your daughter's husband spoken like a girl of spirit said m dantes his eyes sparkling with enthusiasm and admiration now leave me and i will write to vampa zuleika kissed her father and quitted the library with a much lighter heart than she had entered it m dantes by the exercise of his iron will had managed to control himself in her presence but now that she had gone he gave free course to his emotions for a full hour he sat leaning on his writing-table his frame convulsed with anguish and his mind filled with sad forebodings he did not for an instant doubt that both esperance and the viscount could clear themselves from any criminal or dishonourable charge if they would consent to open their lips but their silence and zuleika's belief that they were bound by some some fearful oath gave him great uneasiness besides his son had mentioned luigi vampa's name and the thought that the young man was involved in some complication with the roman bandit sent a chill to his heart he was convinced that whatever had occurred had been merely the result of the folly and headlong disposition of youth but this was scarcely a consolation for he well knew to what length young men sometimes allowed themselves to be carried especially in what they considered a love affair in addition the more he thought of the half-forgotten roman scandal the more clearly its particulars returned to him he remembered that a young and handsome peasant girl had been mysteriously abducted and that eventually she had been brought back to her home by one of the shepherds known to be in league with luigi vampa and his band she asserted that she had been carried off to the bandit's haunt by her youthful lover who had passed for a peasant lad but was in reality a nobleman this was all m dantes could distinctly recall though he was certain he had heard other details that had slipped his memory at the period of the abduction he now remembered both esperance and the viscount were temporarily absent from rome then followed their return and the quarrel that had almost resulted in a duel but had suddenly been patched up without apparent reason had esperance and the viscount been concerned in the abduction that was a question that only they or luigi vampa could answer and it was evident the young men would not speak vampa then must be made to speak for them that was the sole course left to pursue for the peasant girl had disappeared immediately after her return and her whereabouts were a mystery m dantes drew writing materials before him and wrote his letter to the brigand chief it was brief but to the point when it was finished it bore the signature edmond dantes count of monte cristo the deputy placed it in the drawer of his table to go by mail the following morning having first folded and sealed it thompson and french rome was the direction it bore End of section thirty one Section thirty two of Edmond Dantes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
edmund dantes by edmund flagg chapter thirty two interviews the morning following the events detailed in the last chapter as esperance was in his dressing-room preparing to take a short stroll through paris ali knocked at the door and signified that m dantes wished to see him at once in the library as such a summons was something unusual the young man immediately concluded that zuleika had been in consultation with her father and that he would now have to submit to a close and rigid examination he had expected such an examination but nevertheless the summons filled him with dismay and he grew pale as wax his limbs trembling beneath him and his hands working nervously however he braced up as well as he could and with as firm a step as it was possible for him to assume walked toward the library on the threshold he paused and his courage so utterly forsook him that he was tempted to take refuge in flight but the thought flashed through his mind that this would be cowardly and making a supreme effort to control himself he entered his father's presence m dantes who was seated at his writing-table examining a curious manuscript written in arabic characters looked up as he came in and fixed his eyes searchingly upon his son's countenance noting its extreme pallor and remarking with manifest uneasiness the difficulty esperance experienced in maintaining a firm demeanour motioning the young man to a seat he said my son i have sent for you on a matter of the utmost importance and i sincerely hope you will see fit to tell me in all frankness whatever you may know in regard to it espérance partially closed his eyes as if suffering intensely bringing his teeth firmly together and compressing his lips as he did not speak m dantes continued i have every reason to believe that the revelation i am about to ask of you will be exceedingly painful for you to make but you must consider that your sister's happiness is deeply concerned and that for that reason no matter what may be your motives you have not the right to maintain silence i know what you mean father replied esperance in an unsteady voice but notwithstanding the pain it gives me to do so i must ask you nay entreat you not to question me for i cannot answer you m dantes cast upon his son a glance that seemed to pierce him through and through the young man quailed beneath it and again partially closed his eyes while a faint blue shade was mixed with the waxen pallor of his visage the deputy though he had made a profound and exhaustive study of men and their varied motives though he was a skilled anatomist of the human heart and a ready reader of the human countenance acknowledged to himself that this time he was completely baffled was it fear or guilt that esperance exhibited he could not tell but it was abundantly evident that the young man was not acting a part that he keenly felt the suspicions to which he was exposing himself by his inexplicable conduct at length m dantes said in a mild but determined tone esperance my son you can at least enlighten me upon a few points and i request nay i command you to do so are you bound by oath to preserve silence concerning this matter i am bound by a most solemn oath answered the young man with a shudder and is giovanni massetti likewise so bound he is i will not ask you who administered that oath to you or under what circumstances it was taken although as your father i have a right to do so and to compel you to answer neither will i interrogate you further in regard to the main question at issue the complication in which you and the viscount seem to be so hopelessly involved but i insist that you inform me whether any guilt or stain of dishonour rests upon you father said esperance rising and lifting his right hand toward heaven i solemnly swear to you that whatever wrong may have been done whatever crime may have been committed i am entirely guiltless and that there is not the slightest stain of dishonour upon me i believe you my son said m dantes in a tone of conviction and this unequivocal assurance from your own lips 
removes the weight of a mountain from me now tell me is the viscount massetti as blameless in this affair as you are the so-called viscount massetti is a black-hearted villain cried espérance excitedly he is guilty of a foul and revolting crime a crime that should condemn him to a life of penal servitude but may you not be mistaken may you not be the victim of some delusion asked m dantes anxiously i am neither mistaken father nor the victim of a delusion replied espérance positively the charges that i make against that miserable apology for a man i can fully substantiate should the proper opportunity ever be offered me zuleika informed me that while you were speaking with her upon this mysterious subject the name of luigi vampa escaped your lips does that notorious brigand possess a knowledge of this unfortunate matter espérance became violently agitated and instantly answered that is a question my oath forbids me to reply to so be it said m dantes but i have written him and he will reply for you you have written to vampa exclaimed the young man with a terror-stricken look then all is lost m dantes smiled and rising placed his hand on his son's shoulder espérance said he calmly if neither crime nor dishonor attaches to you in this affair as you have sworn you have nothing whatever to fear and besides vampa's disclosures may relieve you of some portion of your heavy burden oh god groaned the young man if vampa speaks how shall i be able to prove my innocence my son said m dantes impressively god whose name you have invoked will not desert you in your hour of need bowing his head in his hands and trembling like an aspen leaf espérance quitted the library with a convulsive sob as if the last ray of hope had been withdrawn from his life and all was darkness and despair m dantes threw himself in his chair and for an instant was plunged in absorbing thought then he arose and putting on his hat and cloak left the library a few moments later he had quitted the mansion by a private door closely muffling his face in the folds of his cloak that he might not be recognized the deputy from marseilles passed hurriedly from street to street until he stood before a massive building in the rue vivienne he rang the bell and when the concierge appeared said to her is the viscount massetti at home the woman a large fat lumbering creature cast a sleepy glance that was half curious half suspicious at him and answered yes monsieur but he bade me deny him to everybody he will see me however my good woman said m dantes take my card to him the fat concierge took the card and glanced at it when she read edmond dantes deputy from marseilles she stared at the famous republican leader like one possessed then filled with awe she hastened away and climbed the stairs as fast as her cumbersome legs would let her she returned panting and puffing followed by the viscount's valet who with much ceremony and obsequiousness conducted the distinguished visitor to his master's apartments the salon into which m dantes was ushered was large and sumptuously furnished evidences of wealth and luxury were visible on every side while everything displayed the utmost taste and elegance to what am i indebted for the honour of this unexpected visit my dear count said massetti rising from a handsomely carved red velvet upholstered armchair in which he had been indolently reclining and coming forward to greet his guest to a matter that concerns both of us deeply replied the deputy in a meaning tone a shadow crossed the viscount's handsome visage but it was gone in an instant and he said with the utmost politeness pray be seated my dear count and before proceeding to business refresh yourself with a glass of rare old burgundy here stefano wine and glasses m dantes sat down in an armchair precisely resembling that from which the viscount had arisen 
Massetti resumed his seat, and the valet brought the old burgundy and glasses, placing the decanter and drinking vessels on a small table of glistening ebony between his master and the deputy. After they had duly drunk each other's health, M. Dantes said, I regret, my dear Viscount, that I am compelled to disturb you, but my business was too urgent for delay. You don't disturb me in the least. Pray proceed. You remember your conversation with my daughter just before you and she parted, do you not? I remember it, replied the Viscount, colouring slightly, and evidently growing ill at ease. In that case, neither preface nor explanation is necessary. I called to ask you a few plain questions. The Italian was now a prey to singular excitement. He grew pale and flushed by turns, finally rising and pacing the salon in great agitation. Count, said he abruptly, when he could command his voice, you are a man of the world and a cosmopolitan, and of course you know that one often commits folly, especially when the ardent an uncontrollable blood of youth is rushing through his veins with this explanation imperfect though it be i must ask you to rest satisfied for it is utterly out of my power to give you any other or to enter into the details of the unfortunate affair which has brought you here i assure you however that i am altogether blameless in the matter investigation will abundantly establish the truth of what i say i will make that investigation i regret that i can neither empower you to do so nor aid you in it what am i to understand by that simply what i say you are doubtless aware that my son makes grave accusations against you that he accuses you in fact of a dastardly crime esperance is mistaken my dear count i swear to you that he is mistaken and that i am as innocent as he is but luigi vampa may have a different tale to tell luigi vampa cried the viscount coming instantly to a dead halt and a sudden pallor overspreading his entire visage yes luigi vampa i have written to him and in two weeks will have his answer for esperance's sake for my sake for your daughter's sake destroy that answer as soon as received and without reading it exclaimed the young italian wildly his pallor increasing to such a degree that his face resembled that of a corpse should i be mad enough to do so said m dantes calmly with it all hope of your marriage with zuleika would perish oh do not say that do not say that groaned massetti what would life be worth to me without zuleika's love then deserve that love by clearing yourself by proving that your record will bear the light of day i have sworn to you that i am innocent is not that enough no replied m dantes coldly i must have proof to support your oath then you believe me guilty in spite of all this is the worst blow yet it is in your power to completely justify yourself at least so you give me to understand and yet your refusal will forever separate you from the woman you love you fill me with despair said massetti in a smothered voice sinking upon a sofa i fain would reveal everything to you but an awful oath of silence stands between me and the revelation then i must wait for vampa's answer and shape my course by that said m dantes firmly that answer will destroy both esperance and myself replied the viscount in a hoarse whisper we shall see returned the deputy rising and resuming his cloak as he stood at the door of the salon with his hat in his hand he added i thought you all a man should be viscount and that you would make zuleika happy but my convictions have been sadly shaken i came here thinking that love for woman was all-powerful in the heart of man that it would induce you to speak even in the face of an oath perhaps violently and iniquitously administered i was wrong farewell m dantes turned slowly and took his departure leaving giovanni massetti 
on the sofa plunged in grief and dismay end of section thirty two section thirty three of edmund dantes this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org edmund dantes by edmund flagg chapter thirty one vampa's answer as the time for the arrival of luigi vampa's answer to m dantes letter approached esperance grew more and more uneasy and serious he spent the greater portion of every day from home apparently for the purpose of avoiding his father and sister when he returned he was moody depressed and silent and far into the night he could be heard pacing his chamber as if unable to sleep from excitement and anxiety zuleika endeavoured to comfort him but all her efforts were fruitless she poor girl was herself overwhelmed with her own distress though she strove to bear up against it massetti had neither written to nor attempted to see her since their separation a circumstance she could not reconcile with his protestations of ardent love for her and this served vastly to augment her sadness and anguish though she still believed in her soul that the viscount was entirely innocent of the crime laid to his charge m dantes who had plunged into politics deeper than ever since the success of the revolution was frequently in consultation with the republican leaders and many of them visited him at his residence and were closeted with him for hours at a time but though seemingly engrossed in state affairs the deputy did not lose sight of his son and daughter or of the mysterious complication that vampa was expected to make clear ali had strict orders to watch both zuleika and esperance and to report to his master whatever they did when at home in his absence but the faithful nubian found nothing amiss save that the young people seemed burdened with a sorrow he could not fathom at length when the two weeks that it would take to hear from rome had expired m lamartine called one morning at the mansion in the rue de helder and having finished his business with m dantes was invited by his host to remain to lunch the repast was served in the salle a manger esperance and zuleika partaking of it with their father and his illustrious guest when the edibles had been removed and the party were taking wine at the dining-table m dantes suddenly remembering that he had an engagement begged m lamartine to excuse him and remain with his son and daughter until his return that would be in half an hour at the utmost this arrangement effected the deputy arose from his chair threw his cloak over his arm and was about to take his departure when ali appeared on the threshold of the open doorway bearing in his hand a letter instantly divining that this was vampa's answer upon which hung massetti's fate and his own esperance leaped to his feet and fixed his wild and staring eyes on the ominous missive as if he would read its contents through its folds zuleika retained her seat but lifted her hands in terror and stared at the letter with pallid cheeks and blanched lips even lamartine turned in his chair and holding his glass in his hand gazed wonderingly at the nubian and the epistle m dantes alone seemed unmoved and his pale countenance gave no sign of the emotion struggling in his breast he stood like a man of iron and extending his hand took the letter without a tremor it was enclosed in a curiously fashioned envelope evidently made by the writer himself and bore the roman postmark the direction written in bold scrawling but perfectly legible characters read m edmond dantes deputy from marseilles number twenty seven rue du helder paris france personal and private this direction was in french ali having retired the deputy calmly broke the seal and hurriedly ran his eyes over the missive esperance and zuleika eagerly and breathlessly watched his countenance while he read but it was as impassable as a countenance chiselled from marble 
when he had finished he turned to espérance and without a word handed him the letter for a moment the young man trembled so he could not read cold perspiration stood in heavy beads upon his forehead and vivid flashes of red passed before his eyes like sheets of lurid lightning what thoughts what suspicions what dread shot through his tortured mind in that brief moment making it seem an eternity of suffering at last steadying and controlling himself by a supreme effort he read the missive from which he had feared such terrible consequences it was in italian and ran as follows his excellency the count of monte cristo you ask me to answer your questions and i comply pasquale solara's daughter annunziata was abducted from her father's peasant home by giovanni massetti known as the viscount massetti who is no doubt the person to whom you allude as now in paris for he has disappeared from rome you are right in assuming that he had aid he was assisted by a young frenchman and that young frenchman was your son esperance annunziata suffered the usual fate of abducted peasant girls and was deserted by her dastardly abductor in a fastness controlled by my band when the abduction took place annunziata's brother strove to rescue her but was attacked and killed by massetti through my means the girl was returned to her home but she was miserable there and fled she is now in an asylum for unfortunate women founded at civita vecchia by the order of sisters of refuge and superintended by a french lady a madame helena de rancogne who as is said was formerly called the countess of monte cristo it is due to your son to say that he was entirely misled in regard to the abduction of annunziata solara and is altogether innocent of crime or intention to commit it the whole burden of guilt rests upon the shoulders of the viscount massetti who i believe compelled your son at the pistol's mouth to take a fearful oath of silence luigi vampa when esperance had read this letter that so effectually cleared him and was such a fearful arraignment of the viscount massetti he restored it to his father and sank into his chair utterly overcome by the terrible excitement and mental strain through which he had passed m dantes forced him to swallow a glass of wine that partially restored him then turning to m lamartine who had been an astonished spectator of this strange and to him incomprehensible family scene he said my dear friend you are amazed and you have a right to be this letter that has caused my son and daughter so much emotion comes from a roman brigand chief no other than luigi vampa whose name is notorious throughout europe you will understand its importance when i inform you that it conclusively clears my son of an exceedingly grave charge m lamartine arose and took esperance by the hand i heartily congratulate you said he and giovanni massetti asked zuleika in a tremulous voice giovanni massetti is unworthy of my daughter's hand replied m dantes let me see that letter said zuleika her cheek growing paler and her heart beating tumultuously her father gave it to her she took it and read each line with an intensity of interest that was painful to behold when she had reached the end her eyes suddenly lighted up and the colour came rushing back to her pallid cheeks esperance she said facing her brother with an air of resolution beneath which he quailed luigi vampa has not told all something he has kept back and that something you know what is it speak luigi vampa has told the truth replied the young man doggedly yes but not the whole truth what has he kept back esperance shook his head he has told the truth he repeated did the viscount massetti administer the oath of silence to you he did then who administered that oath to giovanni the young man did not answer there is some mystery about this complicated affair yet unexplained and until it is explained i cannot believe giovanni massetti guilty 
come come my daughter said m dantes soothingly your heart speaks and not your mind my heart and mine both speak papa replied zuleika and both say that giovanni massetti is innocent let him prove it then i feel certain that he can and will well well child go to madame dantes and take counsel of her only a woman can heal a young girl's love wounds zuleika quitted the salle a manger her countenance yet bearing the stamp of an inflexible belief and a fixed determination esperance said m dantes your honour is unstained and you are restored to my heart i thank god for the blessings of this day you are a true father edmund as well as a true patriot said m lamartine and i feel assured that your son will be worthy of you and of our beloved france that very day giovanni massetti received an unsigned little note written in a tiny feminine hand it was phrased thus i believe you innocent in spite of all prove to me and to the world that you are so enclosed in this little note was luigi vampa's letter to m dantes the next morning it became known that the viscount massetti had disappeared from paris gossip assigned a thousand scandalous motives for his sudden flight but gossip could form no idea as to whither he had fled zuleika however knew that he had returned to italy to clear his name and prove himself worthy of her love end of section thirty three end of edmund dantes by edmund flagg